Going public, the last two weeks I've talked about the unchurched, the importance of us focusing on, not the churched, but the unchurched. And the question is, why are there so many unchurched people in America? And the reason why is because the churched people have hibernated and that we have isolated and we have not reached out to the unchurched. And the unchurched has no desire to come to church and the, and the percentage of people that don't go to church is rising at an alarming rate. And so in this series, I have been ringing the bell of concern. And really, it's the death bell of America if we do not understand the purpose of the church. And the purpose of the church is not to do church for church people, but for church people to come into the house of God with this readiness that when we bring people and that found people bring people and when we bring people in this place that all of us rally together around them and we are serving them and loving them and praying for them and setting the example for them and that we are interested in them and it's how we win the world and so I want to bounce off of a statistic that I have shared with you the last two weeks uh, that is extremely alarming and that is that 65 percent of the kids that are raised in church that when they hit graduation, high school graduation, 65% of those that are raised in church will walk away from the church. That's a three-year-old statistic. This week I came by a brand new statistic saying that that number is now 70% of church kids walk away from the church. And this is alarming. And this is why that I want to address something different this morning than where we've been I want to talk to people that were raised in church that have lost interest. I want to talk to a group of people this morning that, that they, they were raised in church, but they've walked away from the church, and maybe you are in that category. And I want to start off this morning by talking about the story of, of Jacob. The story of Jacob is found in Genesis 25 all the way through chapter 33. It's way too much for me to read, so I'm just going to tell you parts of the story this morning and I'm going to be very short today because we've got some amazing things lined up for you. But I want you to listen for the next couple of minutes. And if you are disillusioned by the church, if you've come and, and you've been wounded by the church and you walked away from the church, I want you to listen to this story. Jacob, the story of Jacob is a story of problems. It's a story of self-inflicted problems that he brought upon himself by his own self-centeredness and his own deceit. And if you'll remember, Jacob was the one that deceived his father. Jacob was the one that deceived his brother. He stole his brother's inheritance from him, which created an enormous amount of family conflict. If you'll remember that, that uh, Jacob's father was Isaac, and Jacob's grandfather was Abraham. And he comes from this strong spiritual heritage. And all of his life, he has sat at the feet of his grandfather and his father. And that he has been able to hear the stories of what God did in Abraham's life. And what God did in his father's life. And he heard all of these stories for years and years. These life-altering stories. Amazing. And he grew up in a good home. He grew up in a godly home. But as you read in Scripture, you never find now, as Jacob is in young adulthood, that he has never himself had an encounter with God. Now, he has lived his life based upon the encounter that Abraham had and his father had, but he has never had that life-changing moment. But, but he had many times and sat and heard the stories, and his family was full of prayer times, and he participated many times with his family in sacrifices. Oh, he knew about God. He was closely associated with godly things. He would label himself as godly, but he had never had that one moment, that one moment that turned his life around. That one moment that he connected with God, and it was his day, his moment, and he was never the same again. He never had that opportunity or he never had that moment. It's much like people today 
It's the very same thing. You know, mankind really doesn't change because so many people will be raised in church from the time that we are born. We're in church, and we go to church every week, and we go to Sunday school. We go to Bible classes. We're involved in student ministries. I mean, we are in church all of our lives, and, and we just assume that everything is okay because we were raised in a Christian home. We label ourselves as Christians, and yet growing up in church, we're living off of our father's experience or our mother's experience, but have we ever had that one moment that everything changed in our lives, that one moment that we abandoned our own life and decided that that now I'm headed in a total different direction because God has so wrecked my life and has so changed my direction. You see, there's no real such thing as a spiritual osmosis. That spiritual things just don't flow from your grandfather to your father into your life. And just because your father or your grandfather or your grandmother had an experience doesn't mean that everything is okay with you because you have to have that encounter with your own life. And you see, you can have a tremendous amount of biblical information. Growing up in church and growing up in classes and Bible classes, you can know the stories of the Bible, you can quote those stories, you can quote volumes of Scripture, but information without transformation will just lead to desensitization. And that we become desensitized many times by being raised in church and hearing the same thing week after week after week. And it's the reason why there are so many people that will view church as boring and as dull. And I can't wait to get out of here. And I, and I can't wait till I graduate from high school. And I can make my own decisions because this has no great value to my life. How can someone say that about spiritual things? And I can tell you why. It's because there are people who are practicing religious acts without a personal God and what happens is that it all it becomes is religious acts let me tell you serving God is far from boring and it's far from dull because when you invite Jesus Christ into your life you are now dealing not with the physical but you are now dealing with the supernatural it is Christ in you that lights us up it is Christ in us, the supernatural, and you begin as a person to do things you cannot do on your own because it is a supernatural power, and it is, it is exciting in our lives because we are now connected with the supernatural and no longer just dealing with the, the natural. And this is exactly where Jacob was in his life. I mean, he was not God-centered. He was self-centered. And every decision that he was making was based on what makes me happy. I mean, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to do what my dad tells me to do. I want to do what I want to do. And what you find is that he created this wealth, this web of self-destruction, and he kept spiraling downward, 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 and it led him to absolute misery. Because all of the decisions that he, were, he was making did not reflect what God wanted for his life. It was all about him, and it created family conflict, to the point that he had to leave home. He was miserable. He was lonely. He was full of regret. And you find in the story that Jacob is running. And he's running from problems. And he's running from the problems that he created in his own life. And he hates his life. And he sits and wonders, how did I ever get to this place? All I wanted in life was to be happy and successful. How did I ever get to this place? And some of you here this morning may identify with Jacob that you're running and you're running from problems and you're running from maybe a past bad church experience and yeah you were wounded and you were hurt and and there was something wrong with with what happened to you and and you're running and and you just keep running maybe you're running from family maybe you're running from issues and your life is an upheaval and you don't even know what to do. And that's exactly where Jacob was. That he was tired. He was weary. And he needed to go back home. He needed to go home and make things right. He needed to go home back to God. But when you read this story, you find that 
that it, it, you sense in the story that he desperately knows he needs God. But he just doesn't seem to know how to get back to God. And this is the, the good news is that when you can't find your way back to God, God will find you. It's amazing how that that works. That, that even though that you, you just can't seem to quite find your way out of the problems and you want God so desperately, God will find you. You know, one night Jacob was by himself and he was out in the middle of nowhere. And it said that he laid down and he used a rock as a pillow. Now, don't you know that you would have to be really tired, really tired to use a rock as a pillow? And he was almost at his end and he lays his head down on a rock and he's staring into the night sky, into the canopy of stars above, and he closes his eyes so weary and tired and he falls asleep. And while he sleeps, God opens up the heavens, and in a dream, God reveals the magnitude of who he is to Jacob. And his story is known to us as Jacob's ladder, and where in this dream he sees a ladder that stretches from where he is all the way into the heavens where God is, and he sees God. And the next morning, he gets up, and he's had this amazing encounter with God, the first one that he's ever had. And that he is so blown away by what he's experienced that he never wants to forget this moment, this time. And he calls that place right where he slept. He said, and this shall be called Bethel. And he called it Bethel, which in the Hebrew means the place that I found God. The house of God where God dwells. This must be the place that God dwells. And he called it Bethel. What I love is the scripture that you find in Isaiah 65, 1. Look what it says. It says, speaking of God, I reveal myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I. And I love that because God is, is going to reveal himself to people that are not asking for him and are not seeking for him and that's what happened to Jacob that night, that when he laid down to go to sleep, God was not on his mind. He was not thinking about God. He was not looking for God. He may not have even wanted God in his life. Everything was centered about himself and his issues and his own problems, and yet God sought him out when he just least expected it. It was a God moment and a transformation in his life. It was a lady who wrote a book. In this book, she told the story of when she was a little girl, and her name was Alice. She said, when I was a young girl, she said, I grew up in a home that, that we never went to church. God was never spoken of. That it was like God did not even exist. But she said, our next door neighbors went to church every Sunday, and she said, so often I would look out my window on Sunday mornings and it was their Sunday morning routine and here they all came out of the house and mom and dad and their three kids and they would get into the car and they'd go to church and I would stand at my window thinking are they right or are we right are they wrong or are we wrong she said that afternoon she was out in the front yard and just sitting in the grass and here are neighbors pulled up from coming from church just like they did every Sunday afternoon. They all got out of the car and as she sat in the grass watching them, she looked up into the sky and she said, God, if you are real, God, if you are real, would you give me a sign and let me know that you are, are there? And she paused for a moment and Alice said, of course, God didn't answer. And God did not give me a sign. And she said, as a little girl, I sat in the grass and realized there is no God. And we are right. She said it was several weeks later. And she had just kind of forgotten it all and wasn't even thinking about it anymore. And she had gone to a, a park that was not very far from their house. She said she remembers that that was the perfect day. The weather was perfect. Everything was perfect. She just felt like she was on top of the world, and she went to the park, and she was sitting on a bench, and she was just looking across the park at how beautiful it was, and the grass, and the trees, and the flowers, and the butterflies flying around the flowers, and 
up above, she looked at this beautiful, bright blue sky and the billowing white clouds and the warmth of the sun. It couldn't have been more of a perfect day. And she said, as a young girl sitting on that bench, the thought came to her, where did all of this come from? That there's no way that it just accidentally happened. And she said, as I sat on that bench that day, I realized that all of this had to have been formed and created by someone. And she said, at that moment, without anyone sitting next to me, I had a God moment, a God encounter, and that I knew at that split second that I knew that I knew that I knew that there was a God. And she said, that day was the day of change. That day was the day I began to seek for God. That day was my Bethel. That day was the day that God came to me when I was not seeking him, that I was not asking for him, and yet God showed up in a, an amazing way. And it changed her life. It changed her life forever. You know, maybe you're here today and you've written God off. Maybe you're here today and you've written church off because you've had a bad experience and today maybe you're filled with questions and doubts and, and you just don't know and yet in the midst of all of that questioning, you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit just saying, come home. Just come home. You own a invite two people to come on the stage with me and and I'd like to ask Jacob and Esther if they would join me and as they're coming to the stage would you give them a big hand this morning <laughs> these two have a great story and and uh, you know they uh, they both were raised in church and it's what we're talking about today and and Esther you know uh, you were raised in church and and I, I want you to just share uh, your story, and, and, and just let, let, us, let us hear what you've gone through, all right? So, like you said, I was raised in church, um, but not just any church. I've actually been raised in this one um, my whole life. So, growing up, I was really involved in fine arts and 212 and a lot of other different areas. But at about 19 or 20, I just came to this season where I just wanted to do life on my own. I wanted to make my own decisions. I didn't want to answer to anybody. I wasn't taking the advice from the people who loved me best here in the church. I, just, I wasn't listening to them, and I just wanted to do life my way. And I moved out of my parents' house for the first time, and that's really when I kind of started feeling, you know, sweet. I'm on my own. I'm living on my own. I can do life my way. And I slowly entered the party scene, um, but it was really when I turned 21 that I kind of went all in. Um, I was, you know, hanging out with friends, we would be drinking, you know, going downtown to the nightclubs, just that whole life. And just living that for a while, I found myself moving in with these two roommates who were not the best examples for me at all. And it was just not an environment that I needed to be in. And on a nightly basis, there was drinking in our apartment, you know, people coming over, and it just was not the kind of life I needed. And then I also had this job where I was making really good money, but I was required to work on the weekends. And I just found myself falling further and further away from God. And I just, I didn't know how I got to this point. Living life my own way was not cutting it. And I just, I finally came to this point where I was tired of it. I wanted to be done. I just, I wanted to feel happy again because all I could feel was emptiness and loneliness. I was depressed. I just, I was not happy with my life. And in January of this year, I, uh, I find myself coming to a good friend's wedding, and it happened to be Brandon and Delaney's. And, you know, I was looking forward to it. I was excited to come to this wedding of a good friend who I basically grew up in church with my whole life. And it was just, it was a night that I was looking forward to. But little did I know that God was going to show up that night. Um, so at the wedding, as they started saying their vows, I just... God just hit me like all at once with everything and he was telling me through their vows you can have this you can have me reflect in your relationship and your future vows one day and your future marriage and just your life in general you can have this but you're not going to have it if you continue down this path that you're going down and the wedding that night truly became my Bethel I just I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that was God speaking to me and that was the night I decided to make a change in my life 
And so the following weekend, I made it a point to come to church before work on Sunday. And I got here to the 10 o'clock service. I met my mom. We actually sat right up there. And that weekend, Dustin was preaching. And he was preaching on the prodigal son. And it was during the Welcome Home ser or the series, Make This Place Your Home. And it couldn't have been a more perfect message for me. I just was soaking everything in. And I just, my heart was just tugging. I just felt this strong sense of God on my heart. And at the end of Dustin's sermon, he asked everybody to stand. And he started asking if there are prodigal sons or daughters out here who need to get out of their pig pen. Take that bold step out of that pig pen and come down to the front. I just immediately lost control. I started crying. I couldn't control my tears. I grabbed my mom's hand, looked at her. She looked at me. And without even saying a word, she walked down to the front with me. And that morning, I came back home. And I just encountered God, like, in the most unreal way. And I just, I truly felt like a completely different person. And now I just have this overwhelming joy and happiness that I didn't before. And I just feel fulfilled. And it's just, it's been one of the most amazing things of my life. Wow. You know, I remember so well that day that it happened. And I think it was maybe just, you know, the next few days that, uh, that you walked through the atrium. And several of us were standing there. And we all said it at the same time, she physically looks different. And you could see that God had done such an amazing work on her life. That one day, that one moment has just changed so much in your life. But you know what I love is what, is what happened to Jacob, is what happened to you. That you went to a wedding. It wasn't a church service. You went to a wedding. And it was in that wedding that God showed up. That became your Bethel. That became your moment that God sought you out. And even though you weren't seeking him and you weren't asking him, he came knocking at your door. And, and you responded, and that's an amazing thing. Also, we have, uh, ironically, we have Jacob on the stage today. We're talking about Jacob. You know, Jacob had a great spiritual inherit, uh, our heritage in the Bible and with Abraham and Isaac. And, you know, Jacob, you were raised in church and had a great spiritual heritage. Your father was a minister for many, many years. But I want you to share your story with us. I grew up in church my whole life. My whole immediate family was involved in church. My dad was a pastor. My brothers became pastors. My sisters were, were really involved singing and playing the piano on the worship team. So whole family just really involved in the church. And um, uh, as time went by, I got a little bit older. Um, I came to a point in my life to where I didn't, I didn't look up to anybody in the church. I didn't want to be like anybody in the church. And um, I started looking up to the gang members in my family. Dudes fresh out of prison is who I looked up to. And that's who I wanted to be like. And that's who began to influence me in my life. And, and that led to, at the age of 14, ended up getting rushed into a gang. From then on, my life just went downhill from there. Uh, started coming home drunk, coming home high, coming home bloodied up from fights on a constant basis. Um, in and out of jails, getting kicked out of schools, went to seven different high schools in three different states. Just all this stuff, I put my family through so much. My, my mother, my father, uh, they dealt with this for four years, just struggling with me. And, on a constant basis, always worrying when, when the next uh, phone call they were going to get when, when they were asleep in bed, what was going on with my son, just constantly just struggling with me for four years. And, and at the age of 15, um, ended up dropping out of school completely, um, started getting into selling drugs, started getting into selling crack cocaine, and um, it only got worse from there. Ended up going to jail. I had a warrant for my arrest, ended up going to jail. And um, the whole thing with my situation, they were telling me I was supposed to be there from weeks to months for a long time in order to deal with my case. And so I'm, I'm getting ready to deal, do my time and just do it. And um, it's funny, on the fourth day I was there, um, one of the, the guards comes up to my cell and she, she tells me, hey, you want to read something? I go, yeah, I want to read something. She goes, what do you want to read? I said, something that's real, something that's nonfiction. So I'm thinking she's going to bring me back like a biography or something. She comes back a couple minutes later and she brings me the Bible. And she goes, <laughs> she goes, you can't get more real than that. So I said, okay, okay. So I start reading, I have this Bible in my hand. You know, I was raised in church. I've heard sermon after sermon. I've been to every single event. I wanted nothing to do with God. At this point in my life, I was so far away from God. I wanted nothing to do with the church or anything. And, and, and I'm finding myself in the cell and I have a Bible in my hand. So I'm reading this, and I would say about an hour later, 
uh, another guard comes up to my cell and I really feel like when I was in this point in my life that God really started showing me. I started having this conviction on the inside. I knew the way that I was living was wrong. What, the, what I was doing was wrong. I was hurting the people that I loved and I didn't want this feeling of conviction, but it was there. And um, about an hour later, I have this Bible in my hand and, and another guard comes up to my cell and he says, hey man, um, they signed off on your warrant. That usually never happens. Um, but they signed off on it. You're free to go. You just dodged the bullet. All right. So I got a Bible in my hand and I'm looking up like, God, are you trying to get at me? What's, you know, what is this? So long story short, I get out and I'm still living the way that I'm living. I'm doing the same stuff that I'm doing. Um, I had this wall that, that I wouldn't let nobody get through. And, and I didn't tell nobody what was going on on the inside of me. But th this conviction was still in my heart that I didn't want, but it was there. It just I, I felt God tugging on my heart and pulling on my heart. And I became, I was still doing the same stuff, but I wasn't comfortable no longer in the position that I was in in life. I, I started questioning, there has to be more to life. There has to be more to, to life than this, than what I'm living. And um, so, long story short, I found myself at a family member's house, my sister's house, actually. And um, I, the way it happened, it, it was as if God positioned everything at the right place at the right time with the right people. And uh, my brother-in-law and my nephew started talking to me. We just started talking about whatever. And um, hours later, it became 4 o'clock in the morning, so we were talking for a while. And um, they started telling me about God, how God had a plan for my life, that God had a purpose for my life. And, and usually, I grew up in church my whole life, so if you try to tell me Jesus loved me or whatever, I would shut you out real quick. But this night, there was something different. I, the, the best way that I can describe it, I was, I was literally on the inside at this point in my life, just self-destructing. I was broken. I was empty. I had nothing to live for. I was a high school dropout doing nothing with my life. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't at a church service. It wasn't at an altar call. But it was that night where they started pouring into me telling me that Jesus loved me, that God had a plan for my life. And that, that was my Bethel. That's where I responded to God. You know, I didn't want him, but he wanted me. And that was the night that, that I responded to his call upon my life. That was my Bethel. Wow. And that's why I accepted Christ again in my life. And, and he changed me from the inside out. He changed me. So. Wow, wow. That, that is amazing. And, you know, God does have a, a great plan for both of your lives. And you know, and Jacob, you're, how old are you? 19. 19. And uh, he, uh, he preached a while back at 212, our student ministries. Let me tell you, this is an amazing preacher of God's word. And what God is doing in your life and what God is doing in your life is outstanding. And it's, and it's, it's just because you responded to his call and you came back home. And, and when we applaud you for that, we thank you for that. Would you give them another big hand? Thank you, guys. You know, I would like to uh, end this story uh, with Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. You find that Jacob sometime later, in verse 24 it says, So Jacob was left all alone. He was all alone in the night. He was there by himself, and, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man, and the man that was wrestling with him was the Lord, and when the Lord saw that he could not overpower Jacob. What? You mean God is, is wrestling with Jacob? God could not overpower Jacob? I mean, God's the creator. God designed and made Jacob, and yet God could not overcome, overpower Jacob? And you know, when you really think about it, the reason why is because God has chosen to put a limit on his life. And he has chosen to put a limit whenever someone chooses to fight against God. He won't overpower you. That whenever you choose to stay away and hold God back and not want him, he will not force you. And that night, God could not overpower Jacob until later on at daybreak when Jacob so grabbed a hold of the Lord. And it says, then the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. And let me tell you, that's where everyone has to come in their life. That they come before God and they're saying, God, I need you and I want you. And, and God, I, I'm going to grab a hold of you today and I'm not turning you loose until I receive something from you, until you bless me. It's that, that desperation that I must have God. I want God in my life. 
That's where Jacob was. That's, that's where Esther was. That's where Jacob was in the, in the Bible. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've been away too long. Maybe you were raised in church and you've you drifted away, or maybe you've, you've never even known him, but you feel the tugging in your heart this morning, and you hear the whisper, just come home. Come home. God's not here to hurt you. God is here to help you. God's not here to fill you with a bunch of useless religion, but he's here to just come into your life as a personal God to work a supernatural work in your life and for you to be who God created you to be. Right where you are and right where you're seated, I'd like to ask every person to bow their head for a moment. As you bow your head, I want you to be in prayer, and, and I want to ask how many of you that, that as I have talked this morning, and you've listened to these stories this morning, and you feel the tug in your spirit, you feel the aching inside, and, and you know it's time for you to come home. You know it's time for you to come home to the God who created you. And you want God, and, and you, right where you are seated, that you want to accept Him as your Lord and God. You want to make this your Bethel, this your day. How many of you would, without any delay, just say, by raising your hand, Pastor, pray for me in this ending prayer, because I want to receive Christ right now into my life. Raise it up high, raise it up high. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. There are hands going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, many, many hands are going up. And this is your moment. And the reason why you just raised your hand. Thank you. The reason why you raised your hand is because you feel the whisper. You feel the tugging. And you want it. You desperately want it. And what you've got to do this morning is grab a hold of the Lord. Grab a hold of Jesus. And you're saying, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to hold on to you. And I want a life change. And all we have to do is pray. All you have to do is invite him in, and it starts that process. You want him more than anything else. And as I pray, you pray right where you're seated. You just begin to pray under your breath and invite him in. Pray your own prayer. You've got to pray it yourself, and I'll lead you, but let's pray and ask that this becomes my moment that I invite God into my life. Lord Jesus, today, I respond. Lord, maybe I have walked into this place today and, and really no thought, no real thought of any kind of life change for me, and yet you sought me out this morning. That, Lord, you sought me out, and I feel the calling, I feel the tug, and, Lord, I respond because I want you. Lord, today I take a hold of you, and I'm not turning loose. Lord, I, I need you. I need a, a desperate change in my life today, and would you forgive me? God, forgive me of my past sins and my past wrongs, but today I want to start all over again. And I just invite you to come into my life, and absolutely I'll sin in the future and I'll have failures, but Lord, I invite you in to be my God, to walk with me, to pick me up, and to help me do what I cannot do. And Lord Jesus, I invite you in to be my God. Lord, I invite you into my life right now. And Lord, I thank you because I know that you said that you would not reject us, but that you would come. And I receive you, and I thank you for that. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a great prayer. And as I mentioned, that is only, only the beginning. And before you leave this auditorium, make sure you reach in front of you, take a card, put your name on that card, your phone number. Check the box that you received Christ as you walk out, as you walk past that table of the atrium that says, I'm new, just drop it off there. You don't need to speak to anyone, just drop it off. And we want to send you some information, and we want to tell you about uh, the next step that will help you tremendously. You know, life change happens here every single week. Every single week. And I want you to look at this, and I want you to watch this, because this is absolutely intriguing of what God is doing among us.
forever you reign, and my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your ways. I will love you forever, and forever I'll say, when the world caves in, still my hope will
Shadow of your wings, I will love you forever. 